says that these Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And that makes sense. What else would you do with 3,000 baby Christians? The law, the prophets, the writings, and Peter's sermon is all that these people knew about what was going on for the most part. The Gospels weren't in existence yet. The Epistles weren't written yet. Paul hadn't even become a Christian yet. And so these Christians devoted themselves to everything the Apostles said and taught. And I submit to you that modern Christians will do the same. Now, I know that most of us in here are not baby Christians. I know that most of us in here have heard more than one sermon. I know most of us in here have our very own copies in many translations of the Hebrew Scriptures and the Greek Scriptures, not to mention the writings of the church fathers and other brothers and sisters down through the ages. But the reality is many of us are not any more prepared to live out the Christian life than these people were. Because many of our brothers and sisters are woefully ignorant of even the most basic teachings of the Scriptures. A part of this is due to elders and preachers and teachers who have not faithfully fulfilled their tasks. But part of it's also due to church members who are just too bored or busy to care. Listen, the Apostles' teaching has come down to us in definitive form in the New Testament. And so contemporary devotion to the Apostles' teaching will mean submission to the authority of both the New Testament and the ancient Scriptures that those New Testament authors relied upon. Hosea warned that his people were destroyed for a lack of knowledge and the New Testament writers consistently encourage their audiences to move on from infancy, to rightfully handle the word of truth, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But in a lot of churches, it seems that there is an anti-intellectualism. There's a fear of asking questions. There's a fear of learning for ourselves the truth of God's Word. We'd rather sit in our segregated classes and do psychotherapy than actually engage the teachings of the apostles and prophets. May it never be. May we always be a church devoted to studying and to conforming our lives to the apostolic doctrine. This was a learning church. But that's not all. It was also a loving church. Again, verse 42 says that these Christians were devoted to the apostolic teaching, but also to fellowship. What is fellowship? Is fellowship what happens here during intermission? You know what intermission is, right? That 15 minutes between class and worship. Is that fellowship? It can be. Is fellowship what we do uh, after the food and presence over in the OR a couple of times a month? Can be. Is fellowship what happens on Sunday evenings in our heart group, if your heart group still meets? That's actually probably more of it. The Greek word translated as fellowship is the word koinonia, and literally the word has the meaning of commonality commonality. This is the first time it appears in the New Testament, and every time it appears in the New Testament, it has something to do with sharing or giving. Uh, this is the word Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 when he writes about the Macedonians sharing with the poor saints in Jerusalem. That's fellowship. It's the word Paul uses in Philippians 1 to describe the Philippians' financial partnership with Him in the spreading of the gospel, that's fellowship. And it's the word used here in verses 44 and 45 to explain how this first church held all things in common. You see, in order to have fellowship, you have to have investment. Fellowship costs something. 
And it's highlighted again in our text. If you turn over to chapter 4, you, you read this same description again. Look in verse 32 of chapter 4. Now the full member of those who believed were one in heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was among, or upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Uh, I guess the point of this is that this is not just a sentimental feeling of oneness. It's not just saying we are a family, but then going our separate ways. It's not just punching cookies. It doesn't take place just because people are in a gym. Fellowship comes through giving. True fellowship costs. And maybe the reason that so many people don't really know the joy of being a part of a church is because they've never learned to invest in one. They come in expecting to be slobbered upon. They come in expecting to have all of their felt needs, legitimate or otherwise, met. But they don't come in expecting to get involved and to be invested and to have commonality and to know fellowship. We don't like the prospects of getting too involved. We don't want to really get involved in other people's lives and messes. Our lives are messy enough. And so we prefer to keep our Christianity a personal relationship with Jesus. And we say to people, this is between me and Jesus. You, I'll know you on Facebook. But that's not fellowship. That's not the church. That's not accountability. That's not responsibility. That's not investment. This church was about investment. May we never be so consumed with ourselves that we can't give ourselves away to our brothers and sisters. May we always be devoted to true and sweet fellowship. So this was a learning church. It was a loving church. It was also a worshiping church. Verse 42 says that these Christians were devoted to breaking bread and prayer. Literally, the text says, the breaking of bread and the prayers. That definite article out there in front tells me that, that we should see the act of eating the Lord's Supper together and reciting specific prayers, both Jewish and Christian. The, the point is that this church was devoted to worship. Their religion was expressed both in terms of investing in their neighbor, loving their neighbor, and in terms of loving God, worshiping Him supremely. A couple of things stand out to me about their worship. First, they worshiped both formally and informally. They met together in big groups at the temple. They also met in small groups from house to house. And, and two, the, Luke says their worship was characterized by both awe and gladness. I never cease to be amazed at the number of churches splitting over worship places and worship styles. I never cease to be amazed at the number of people searching for churches based on worship places and worship styles. And you know as well as I do, it gets ugly in some places. But if I'm reading this text correctly and the rest of Scripture correctly, there are, there are all kinds of worship taking place in all kinds of places characterized by both spirit and truth. You listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, Thy brothers couldn't dress you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk and not solid food, for you weren't ready for it. And even now you're not ready, for, for you're still in the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not in the flesh, behaving only in a human way? For when one of you says, I want to attend the contemporary service, and the other, I want to attend the traditional service, are you not being merely human? 
Okay, I paraphrase that just a little bit. That whole setup there in 1 Corinthians was screwed up. And I want you to listen to me very carefully now because it's not just about worship styles. There are forces invading our churches today bent on undermining millennia of historical Christian tradition. And all to score a political point or to forward a personal agenda. May we never be so insistent upon getting our way that we can't worship together in spirit and in truth. So then there's one more. And this is kind of the climax of them all. This is kind of what happens when you get a learning, loving, worshiping church. And that is this, you get an evangelistic church. Now the text doesn't say that these people devoted themselves to evangelism. But the way I read it, if you do what they did, they really couldn't help but be evangelistic. Look at verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. As this church worshiped daily, as it went about its business daily, it witnessed daily. I don't know if they knocked on doors. I kind of doubt it. I don't know if they mailed out flyers or hosted gospel meetings. I kind of doubt it. What I do know is that the lives they lived before the world caught not only the world's attention, but its favor. And lives were being changed. It's a shame to me that the church has fallen so far out of favor with the peoples of the world. How can a religion like Islam have a better reputation among many than Christianity? The answer is pretty simple. Not only are we not transforming lives, we are not living transformed lives. Paul says the goal of God's work in us is transformation. And Peter says that transformation is on display and it makes a difference. Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul and keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. These early Christians lived such good lives among the pagans that they were looked on with favor. One of my favorite quotes all time comes from St. Francis of Assisi. He says, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. May our lives be so consumed by learning, loving, and worshiping that they can't help but be consumed by evangelism. I think that's a pretty perfect church. One that learns, one that loves, one that worships, and one that evangelizes. Listen, if you're out there this morning and you're looking for the perfect church, I hope you find it. And then I hope you come back and tell us so we can join it. But I have my doubts that you'll ever find it. Because as long as churches are made up of flawed human beings, they're going to have some flaws. And that's the way it is here at Highway. We're not perfect. We don't claim to be. But we are trying our very best to offer biblical teaching, loving fellowship, living worship, and ongoing and outgoing evangelism. These are the things that we're interested in because from what I read in Scripture, these are the things that make the church what it ought to be. In fact, I would like to submit to you this morning that Acts 2, 42 to 47 ought to be the mission statement of the Highway Church of Christ. 
It ought to inform every decision we make, every program we undertake. We ought to put it on our doors. That at Highway, we seek to draw near to God through the teaching of His prophets and apostles and through spirit-filled and truthful worship. Matt, I've got these on a slide if you'll bring them up, unless I forgot to push save. At Highway, we draw near to God through the teaching of His prophets and apostles and through spirit-filled and truthful worship. At Highway, we draw near to each other in fellowship, supporting each other and relieving the needs of the poor, both of our congregation and our community. And at Highway, we draw near to the world in evangelism, living lives that gain the favor of all the people we come in contact with, drawing them ever closer to the God we serve. Listen, if that sounds like a church you'd like to be involved in, then we'd love to have you involved with us at Highway. If we fail to live up to that, then we need to repent because we're not being what God has called us to be. So as we go out this week, let's strive to be a perfect church. Let's learn. Let's love. Let's worship. And let's evangelize. If there's anything in your life that's keeping you from doing that, you need to repent. And if you'd like to be a part of this, come join us while we stand and sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay, are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of a lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Please be seated. Got a couple of announcements this morning, uh, or prayer requests actually. It, one's pray for Jerry Neal. Uh, he is still uh, is still suffering from the result of pneumonia, and we need to pray for him and and uh, everything going on with that. This is from Dana McMillian. Uh, he wants 
he had asked for prayers for Cindy Hill, his niece who has stage four cancer. The treatment there that she's going through is not working and they're gonna try something new. So uh, they asked for prayers for success and all that thing. I wanna thank everybody for being here this morning and uh, worshiping with us. Um, we will have class for those that are visiting in, in this auditorium and that auditorium and then across the way at the OR building. If you have questions about that, just uh, holler at someone here and we'll, they'll help you with it. Again, I want to thank everybody for being here this morning and hope that uh, your week will be well and we can live up to the, the sermon this morning, which was very powerful, very powerful. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing of your continued kingdom on this earth and your continued giving a blessing to each one of us through the word, through the preached word, through the shared suffering sometimes in this church and in in this world and some and through the shared blessings that, that come apart about it. We thank you so much for your son that through him we can have access to the wonderful blessings that are that are our you and that you give to each one of us. We ask that you watch over each one of us as we go about our daily life. Help us to live it in such a way that people will say that there's something different about them. What is that? And I want to know about it. We ask that you bless us in our struggles, bless us in our difficulties, and, and help us to learn what we need to learn from those things that you have placed before us. We ask that you be with us, be with this congregation, and be with those that are sick of this, of this church and help us to fulfill whatever needs that we need to fulfill with them. Help us to reach the community around us. Continue to encourage each one. Thank you again for your son. In his name we pray. Amen. We're dismissed.